Um, so with the regulatory update, um, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so we've been talking about this for, for the last couple of years. Um, the EPA put out new certification and training regulations. Um, so they went into effect uh, last March. They went into effect last March, but we have a five-year window to, to, to get on board with this. So um, we have a five-year window to change our regs internally and then, and then get you guys on board too. It's really not gonna affect Maryland a whole lot. We do have to, uh, private applicators um, currently can be 16 to get a private applicator certification. Uh, we are gonna have to change that to 18. Um, they're on the commercial side of things there uh, uh, we have what we call registered employees um, those to get a, to be a registered employee you have to train that employee within 30 days from the date of hire and it, it's pretty much a once and done deal um, if they are going to be using restricted use pesticides they need to go through an annual training so we're not sure how we're going to come up with a training program for that or if we're just going to require them all to be certified um, and then for private applicators, we are going to have a soil fumigation category. This has been a little point of contention for, for me, not that we have a lot of folks doing fumigation, um, but basically you could be doing fumigation for the last 30 years. That's not good enough. Now you're going to have to come back and take an exam according to EPA. So we're trying to get that worked out so that we can grandfather some folks in and um, do it that way but so far they've been fighting most of the states on that so we'll see what happens um, there's been some paraquat changes um, this has kind of snuck up on us because um, apparently it's it happened in in 2016 is when they first decided uh, when they were first discussing this the basic gist of it is it's it's kind of paraquats so uh Gramoxone's going the same way as dicamba did um, for the dicamba over top of soybeans. Um, if you are going to use Paraquat, you are going to have to go through a, a separate training program. You can do that. Um, there's a, on the label, there's a link that you can go to and you go to a manufacturer's training program. Um, you go through that training program, you print out your certificate or save your certificate um, because you need to prove that you've been through that. Um, but um, that, unlike dicamba, which has to be every year, uh, training has got to be every three years. Um, you have to be certified. You can no longer, no one can use it under your supervision anymore. So if you want to use germoxone or any other of the generic paraquats, you are going to have to be certified to do that. Um, 2020 is when most of this should come to play. There may be a few new labels out there now in the marketplace. I haven't seen any just yet. Um, but if you do grab a, a Gramoxone or, or Paraquat label that um, uh, happens to be one of the new labels, um, it'll be very clearly marked on the top that, that you have to be certified to use it. Um, and uh, the training requirements will be listed on there. So just make sure you do that. But EPA expects, and most of the manufacturers expect, it's going to be 2020 till all the existing stocks are really out of the marketplace. Um, so again, dicamba training. Now this, this just refers to dicamba that's being applied over, over top of soybeans for the dicamba-ready soybeans. Again, that's, it's all of those products, those specific products for the, that specific use are res considered restricted now. Um, even though the other dicamba products are not. Um, so you must be certified in order to use it. You must go through an annual training program in order to use it as well. There's different um, restrictions on the labels as far as buffers and uh, checking uh, uh, weather conditions, uh, wind speeds, and um, whether or not there's inversions in place. So. Uh, worker protection standard ch changes. We've been talking about this for the last several years. Um, you know, we, we've got, there's no longer, the biggest change is uh, training has to be done immediately. So if you have workers on, on the farm, you've got to get those folks trained immediately. Um, you can do it if you're a certified applicator. Um, the, um, 
used to be handlers could train them, but no longer. So basically a certified applicator is going to have to train them or someone who's gone through a, a state um, course. Handlers do have to be 18 now. Um, another big change is you need to provide respirator fit testing um, as, as it as OSHA, you know, with following the OSHA requirements and the OSHA standards. Um, so if, if, if the label requires a respirator, you, you need to get your handler medically cleared and fit tested in order to wear that respirator. On the shore here, we've, there's um, some urgent care clinics, I think called your docs in. I think uh, they, they do that for you. Um, Gampler sells test kits that you can do. Um, but they are, you know, that's as far as fit testing, but they are still have to go in, they're going to have to go through that, that physical so they can get medically cleared. Um, there are actually some, uh, sites that you can do it online. Um, and then they're, they're reviewed by a nurse practitioner or a doctor, uh, to, to, uh, clear your, your workers. So specific water amounts for routine washing have gone up a little bit. So one gallon for each worker, three gallons for each handler um, or early entry worker. Follow the label. Um, changes are addressed on the label. As far as enforcement here in Maryland, um, and if anyone here happens to be from Delaware, I think Delaware's kind of in the same boat. Um, we're primarily doing compliance. If, if we come in to do a worker safety inspection, unless, unless we've been called in due to a complaint investigation, which I can say for the last three years, we have known no complaints as far as worker safety goes. But um, we will do a compliance inspection with you. So we will go through everything that, that the new rule requires, make sure you got it all in place, and that's it. Um, we're not looking at taking any enforcement actions at, the, at this time, again, unless, unless it's a complaint-driven inspection. So one of the places you can get any possible information you want on worker safety is, is uh, this site here. Um, or if you want to Google PERC WPS, it comes right up. So all your training materials there. You can download training videos. You can download posters. Um, anything you could possibly need for, um, to get yourself in compliance with, with the, what the new rules require. Um, legislative update. We, it's been somewhat quiet. Um, we knew this was going to be coming down the pike. Uh, this, we had a similar bill last year that hit and, and didn't make it through um, committee. Um, but uh, basically there is a chlorpyrifos bill that's going through the House and Senate to, to ban all uses of chlorpyrifos by 2020. Um, it's gone through the House. Um, they've had their hearing. It goes through the Senate hearing uh, next week, I think on the 27th. Um, I mean, realistically, we don't have a lot of use of chlorpyrifos here in Maryland, but, but you know what we do have, it's, it's still an important tool. So, I mean, if this is something you're really interested in, um, you know, you need to get a hold of your legislator and uh, talk to them about it. But um, we're not sure what's going to happen. Um, we haven't heard any, anything as far as yay or nay on this, but um, we'll keep you posted. Um, due, to the, due to those C&T regs, we are going to have to submit some changes within our regulations um, requiring 18-year-olds, uh, minimum age of 18 for private applicators. So that's going to have to come here within the next few years. Um, and like I had mentioned before, we are also looking at restricting the use of, of restricted use pesticides to, to only certified applicators. Um, but we're not sure how that's going to work. Um, we've, we've in the, with the private applicators, we do have a lot of folks that aren't <coughs> certified private applicators that, that are using it under the supervision. So, um, we're still kind of hammering this one out. Something new this year. Um, some of you may be familiar with our old, uh, se sensitive crops registry. Um, we've been looking at this program here for three years, uh, so Maryland is now a member of Field Watch. Um, so it, it uh, specifically contains Drift Watch and a, another product called B-Check. 
So uh, what you can do is you can go in and register your crop. Um, you, you can register your crop as, or farm as, as uh, having a sensitive crop. Um, and what that enables applicators to do is to go onto this site to see where those locations are. Um, it, it's, a, it's a voluntary system, just like our old um, in-house system that we were using. Uh, there are no enforcement issues here. We're not taking enforcement on anybody or anything like that. If, if they don't register or if, or if there a drift, ha drift occurs or something like that, this, this is to just get the applicator and the grower talking, hopefully. Um, what's great about this program, at least for us, is our old in-house system, we did it all the paperwork will come to us, we would enter it into the database, then that database would be sent to our marketing folks who would do something on their end and then it would get sent to Towson and put online. Um, it, it, it wasn't overly efficient um, and uh, the upkeep on it wasn't done very often. Um, with this here you can, go, you can go to the field watch site, you log in, you take care of it all yourself, you fill out the paperwork. Um, Next year, around this time, you'll get an email saying, hey, would you like to update your information? Uh, you update your information so you remain on the site. It does, um, it allows, there's, there's three different parts to this. There is a public map which is free for anyone to look at, uh, anyone in the country. Um, all crop sites and most, most beehives. Um, uh, beekeepers tend to like to keep the, their beehives uh, locations secret, um, so the option was given to them that um, they can be kept out of the public map. Um, if you sign up as an applicator, there's no fee, if you sign up as an applicator, um, you would have access to all the sites in Maryland, um, both the bee check sites and, and the crop sites. Um, and then there's also a, a member data subscription um, which would give you all sites across the country and um, you could do live streams and, and uh, downloadable content but um, but we are hoping um, I have nobody logged into the drift watch site this yet um, we, we came online right before the new year and um, I've got um, probably 50 or 60 beekeepers um, that have that have uh, registered no crop sites yet, but um, we're hoping that comes. So if anybody wants to utilize the site, we are hoping you do. Um, this is free for you all to use. It wasn't free for me, so I'm hoping I get some, <laughs> hoping I get some uh, folks, uh, folks on board here. But um, one of the primary things we're trying to do with that is, is to hopefully, drift has been a big issue for us, and we're just trying to, trying to hope to uh, to lower our drift complaint numbers. Um, Pollinator Protection Act, uh, it's, this wouldn't affect a whole lot of you folks, but um, um, we have been inundated with calls on this. Uh, it was effective starting January 1st last year. Um, it is a very confusing, confusing bill. Um, there's been a lot of articles, uh, Chesapeake Bay programs put stuff out. Um, they're calling it a ban, it's not a ban. Um, basically it just, if you're a certified applicator, a farmer, or for some reason a veterinarian, you can use the product. Um, I say for some reason a veterinarian, but all, all pet care and personal care products were exempt from this, so I'm not sure why the vets were still included in this. But, um, but certified applicators and farmers um, are still allowed to use the product. Uh, it's not a restricted use product in Maryland, but it can only be sold in Maryland at restricted use pesticide dealers. So, um, and it, it only, it's only for outdoor use products. So if you've got a product that's labeled indoor, you can use it um, if you're not certified. Um, if you're a retailer and the product's labeled for indoor and outdoor use, you can still sell it without being a restricted use pesticide dealer. So it's, it's, it's been a bear to enforce. We've got a lot of people enforcing it for us. Um, so, but um, 
we're doing the best we can with it. So um, regulation staff overview, we've, we're going to have some turnover here. We, we've lost an inspector, actually did an interview interviews last week. Um, we're hoping she accepts the position. Uh, she's located out in Cumberland. We do need a inspector out in the Western Maryland. Um, but you've got Dennis Howard, uh, my chief, our program manager, uh, who will be retiring as of May 31st. Uh, myself, uh, who coordinates the enforcement programs. Certification training coordinator, we, we really don't have one in place. Um, we do have someone acting, uh, Russ Norto, who's been one of our inspectors for years. We brought him at, in out of the field to, to um, because I, I got tired of interviewing every other year for that position. So um, I was hoping maybe he'd stick around for a little bit, but uh, he's still acting. They haven't made him permanent. Our Ag Inspector Manager, who, who really oversees all of our inspectors, he, Ellis Tinsley, he will be retiring as of April 30th. Um, and then our admin staff, Jess Koontz, has been a longtime uh, office secretary for us, and uh, Carolyn Shepke, uh, Hannah Pete, and then Robert Day and Gina Lynn Santos are our contractual and temporary folks that we bring on this time of year um, to get ready for renewal time. So uh, again, David Parks is here on the shore. Uh, Kelly Love uh, joined us last year. Um, she's um, up in, in, in north and, and part of central Maryland. And uh, Yapa is currently covering out west. If we can get that one person hired, if she accepts the, the position, um, Yapa will move to pretty much Montgomery and Howard counties, and that's it. And uh, Bray covers our southern Maryland area. Um, if, we get, uh, if we ever get Russ Nortel approved full time as our certification and training coordinator, um, we will be hiring another inspector, um, preferably on the Eastern Shore, so we can give David Park some relief. Um, a little over 1,000 pest control businesses, 240 public agencies. Uh, we do have uh, 3,000 private, almost 3,000 private applicators in the state as of last year. Um, and we are dealing with, with about 6,500 uh, registered employees. Um, We've, we've, we've talked about this in the past. It's, it's come up again. We've had some issues last year, private versus commercial. You know, private, private certification allows you to, to purchase and use restricted use pesticide products as long as you're using them on your property or, or property that you're renting. Um, the second you make an application for your friend or your neighbor, um, if you're doing it for free, fine. Um, if you're doing it for a favor, if you're doing it for money, then, then you fall into that commercial category. Um, you know, obviously we're not, you know, if your neighbor gets into a bind and you need to help them out, fine, you need to help them out. Um, we're not going to fault you for that. But, um, but we did have some problems last year with a lot of private applicators um, collecting some money and, and doing some bartering on the side for, uh, um, they got a new spray rig and they just, they were going to town. So. Uh, training manuals, anybody, uh, uh, if anybody is interested or if anybody needs that, um, a lot of, uh, for, for private applicator, a lot of times it follows the core manual. Of course, you can get that through your extension office. Um, but if you're looking at some of the commercial categories to take, uh, we do have those uh, manuals supplied by us, and, and um, a lot of them, too, are online. Um, there are video tutorials. Um, I got killed last year at this meeting about our wonderful online system. Um, so there, there, there have been uh, Veronica who, who, Johnson who was doing our certification training about a year and a half or two years ago, or whatever it is now. Um, she did put some of these together with, with the uh, extension staff up in Carroll County. and. Um, they're pretty good. It'll take you step by step on, on how to get through the, the, um, our, our website. Um, and again, we've been, we've been touting this at the last several meetings. We really want to get away from social security numbers. So please try to bring your certification number. It's also a good time to remind me if you haven't signed that sheet, please don't forget to sign your, your sheet that's going around. Um, because just because you're here doesn't mean you're going to get credit. We need to see that sheet. Um, so if you have lost your little certificate, your applicator certification, 
or if you're like me, you stick it in your wallet or, or somewhere um, that the number tends to peel off, give us a call. We can send you a new one um, or at least tell you what your number is. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but I think you said that last year, so you don't know. <laughs> Again, here's our online renewal system, and, and I know this, this isn't, I don't, this is the blind leading the blind on this. I don't spend a lot of time on this system myself, um, but um, for some reason on the, on the private applicator side, we have been having a lot of issues um, with, with folks being able to get on and, and, and get their stuff together. Um, but. One of the most important things you need is your, your postcard that comes in. So don't throw it away because you are going to need that license number and renewal code. That license number is not your certification number. Um, we, we use an Oracle database which is full of numbers. Uh, there are more numbers on that database than, than we know what to do with. Everyone, everyone has a, every number has a, a reason for being there and every single one of them are generated automatically. So. Um, that license number and that renewal code is what you need to get into the system. Um, when you get into the system, I'm told basically don't, on the private side, you know, you're going in for, as a private applicator, don't download anything. Don't type in what meetings you've been to. Just get into that site, click renew, and you're going to be able to renew. We know what meetings you've been to as long as you sign that sign-in sheet. Um, but again, and there's your certification card. That's your certification number. Um, the control number is for us uh, on, on the other side. It's what we also call your account number. It's how we, we in government, we have to track you somehow. Um, but uh, again, for the time being, if you absolutely have no idea what your certification number is and you don't feel like looking it up on your phone before you leave here today and sign the sheet, just put the last four digits your social security number. We are trying to get away from that though. Um, we're one of the, we, we still use social security numbers to track everyone because everyone seems to at least remember the last four digits of that social security number. <laughs> so, um, but we do, you know, our IT folks want us to get away from this. The upper management wants us to get away from, from social security numbers for obvious reasons. And, um, We've got this wonderful idea of, of putting barcodes on everybody's certification cards so that we can just come in and scan it during a meeting and be done. But that might work great on the commercial side. I'm not sure how well it's going to work on the private applicator side. So we're, we're, we're trying to figure this out to make it the easiest way we can possibly do this. Because at some of the larger meetings, you're sitting in line for three hours just trying to sign the sheet. So our enforcement update, um, overall complaints, we've, we've been down over the last several years. You know, we've only had 37 complaints last year. We've been in the, the the mid to upper 30s for the last several years. Um, ag complaints, 16. Ag complaints, now, in the realm of things, 16 ag complaints compared to how many ag applications occur over the course of the year is, um, my guess is relatively small, 16. Um, however, for us, that number is growing. Um, we generally, four, five, eight was always the highest, um, you know, and, and all 16 are drift. So, turf and ornamental, four, all, all four are drift. Um, neighbor versus neighbor, that even though there's only four there, those are our biggest callers anymore. Um, those are the four that we chose to investigate. Um, we keep a log of all of the ones that come in, and um, we had 104 last year. So 100 plus those four. Um, a lot of it's property dispute, property line dispute. Um, a lot of it's just, they really hate each other. I mean, they, they just, they can't stand their neighbors. Um, you know, and, and a, a big thing that's coming up too, uh, that we see a lot um, is, um, we, don't, we don't put it on here as part of our complaints. It happens so often, I just have a form letter that I send out to everybody, uh, sending them a notice of warning and, and letting them know what the regulations are. Mothballs, um, folks using mothballs in the yard to um, get rid of nuisance pets and wildlife. Um, like I said, it happens so often that I have a form letter um, and I send probably seven or eight of those out every week. And um, 
it starts now and it ends about December. And there's a couple couple months where it doesn't we don't really get a whole lot. But um, um, so and I don't care what grandfather, father, because I went through it too. Mothballs do not repel squat. <laughs> snakes, they're actually not bad at snakes, but if you're trying to keep mouse and rats out of your, yeah, you, you want the snakes. So, but um, there, there are a ton of, of repellents that can be used to, to get, try to repel cats and dogs. And if you find one that works, let me know. I'll pass it along to these folks, but it's just, we even had the Montgomery County Humane Society mention it to their county residents to use mothballs. So, um, do I? To use them or not? To, to use them. Oh, well, I used to use them all the time, too. Until I started working here, I thought, hey, yeah, I guess that is illegal. <laughs> so, it is a label violation. They're used it's for closed moths and their larvae, period. You, know, you can't just toss them out in the yard. You can't put them in a little cheesecloth and put them, hang them from trees. We have people hanging them from trees. Trees, at the basis. I know. For yep. I did too. So. Hmm? Yeah. It, it's, the crows. The crows pick them up. Uh, dogs pick them up. Especially the ones that aren't naphthalene. They do make some out of camphor, um, and the dogs seem to like those. Um, the, the other issue we've been having is, is EPA put new restrictions out on, on rodenticides years ago. Um, you know, you used to be able to go and get the little decon, you know, you, know, you pull the little packet back. Well, you can't do that anymore. Um, I mean, there might be some stores that still have it. You're allowed to get rid of existing stocks, but you're seeing a lot more bait stations and the block baits is for sale in the hardware stores and that. Um, problem is, and I don't know that EPA recognized this when they did this, but um, I can go into the store and buy a bag of blocks. I can go to Ace, I can go to Lowe's, I, wherever. I get a bag of, of bait blocks that are supposed to go into my station. If they're just refillable, you know, I can just buy a bag of 16 blocks. And they're cheap. Five bucks, eight bucks, ten bucks. It's cheap. Um, for 12, 15, 20 blocks. Well, people are just taking those blocks and, you know, and it's, they're just, so we, we investigated three complaints, both in Montgomery County, um, and where we had dead squirrels everywhere, um, which he was, that's what I was trying to kill. So he did what he was trying to do. And, um, but, um, you know, but we also had, had uh, reportedly 15 dogs got sick, two died. Um, we couldn't prove that. Montgomery County themselves couldn't prove that either, but that's that's what we were told so but again overall our complaints are down egg, like I said egg complaints on the whole really 16 is not bad it's just um, you know we were used to seeing them a little lower than that um, so there's there's the egg egg complaints so um, six six of the 16 were all private so 10, 10 of the remaining were then on commercial applicators four ground four aerial um, we did investigate one bee kill, um, which bee, bee kills are very tough. Um, EPA put out guidance for us to follow, and you, you really, it, there, it's, it's great if you had a big bubble around your property and that's the only place bees would eat, but you know, they're going out two miles, sometimes three miles in, from that hive. Um, so sampling bees is a waste of time because we could be pulling all kinds of pesticides out of them because they could have been visiting a number of different places. Um, pulling from the hive, anything from inside the hive doesn't necessarily work either. So a lot of times what we will do is we'll swab the hive and we'll pull some samples around the hive to see if we can prove that drift happened. Um, most of the times it's very hard and we don't. Uh, in this instance, we did issue a violation because the applicator, it was an aerial application, the applicator violated the label. Uh, the label said do not apply when bees um, are foraging in the area. That's a very tough thing to enforce. Um, however, he sprayed it at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, September. It was 74 degrees. Um, I would stake my life that bees were foraging in the area. It was a lima bean field. Lima beans bloom from the time they start till you harvest them. So the field was blooming. I know there were bees out there, so he was, he was cited for that label violation. 
Um, labels are getting a little more strict on, on some of this bee, you know, where the bees are involved. And, and um, it's not going to just say if bee just, bees are foraging in the area, they're going to say do not spray. Um, some of the labels do say now do not spray until petals have fallen. Again, if you've got products, there's several products in, for lima beans, and they all, if they all come out and say do not spray until petal fall, I don't know what we're going to use on limas. But um, so again, there's a overall. So you know, we've we, we're slowly on the rise, but again, in the realm of things, it's it's 16. I'd love to see it go back down to eight or four or six. That that'd be fine, but. Um, um, drift, drift is a big issue for us and, and we're trying to address that. We're actually looking at uh, possibly uh, revamping our drift regulations as well. Um, our state chemist is, he can find down to the parts per trillion. You're talking about one part per trillion, which is nothing. Um, one part per trillion, you could have had your field sprayed yesterday, you could be driving through it in the pickup truck, kicking up dust, and I could find one part per trillion or more on your neighbor's property the next day. Is that drift? No, not the way it's defined. So um, we are looking to try to better define it. Um, Maine has a system in place now where if you find X percentage in the treated field and X percentage in the, in the, on the complainant site, they'll cite a violation then. But we're not sure what to do because we find such low numbers where the complainant is. We actually haven't been citing violations. We've been issuing kind of, you know, hey, be a little careful, um, but we can't conclusively, when, it, when I'm looking at six, seven, eight, ten, even a hundred parts per trillion, I, I, can't, I can't honestly say that came from the actual application itself. Um, real quick, I want to go through this. Um, we haven't, you, you've seen these slides before. We, we've gotten away from it. Um, we're, we're, we don't see this on the ag side so much. We do see a lot of ornamental turf. Um, but just make sure you're wearing the proper PP. Where the, you know, read that label. Um, make sure it's in good repair. Um, especially, you know, now with some of the WPS rules, you know, you make make sure that stuff is is in operating condition. Um, you know, know what's required. Um, they keep saying they're going to simplify the label as far as PP is concerned. We're still waiting to see if that ever happens. Um, hope, hopefully it, it, it's in the near future. I know um, Washington State and some of the other universities have been working, working with EPA and trying to get a little more simplified as far as what PPE is required. Um, you know, I mean, re really a lot of, lot of products. This is what you're going to see. Long sleeve shirt, shoes, socks, um, and protective eyewear sometimes, but, but a lot of times it'll just say chemical resistant gloves or waterproof gloves. Um, you know, uh, we get a lot of phone calls, you know, my neighbor's out spraying, he has no PP on, well, what's he wearing? He's pants and a shirt, and I was like, well, if it's a long pants, long shirt, well, yeah, he's probably fine. Um, especially since he's just spraying, well, you don't want to mention or Roundup anymore. But, um, so again, wearing gloves, uh, it, it really does reduce your exposure. Uh, um, Jimmy Lewis in Caroline County do, does, every once in a while, he does a safety presentation and, and, and uh, <coughs> Wearing gloves really, really does reduce, reduce what you're doing. Um, make sure your application equipment is in proper working order. Um, no leaks, um, especially if you're going down the road. Uh, if, if you've got to go down the road to the next field down, um, and it is, as silly as this sounds, and if you're using a foam marker on your equipment and you're driving down the road, Try to get that foam cleaned off before you come out in the road because you have no idea how many phone calls we get from foam flying off the back of the rig. Um, again, follow label instructions. Uh, we've, we've beat you all to death on this um, for years and years and years. We're starting to bring it back. So, um, you know, make sure you know what's on that label. These labels change um, yearly. Um, and sometimes there's updates made during the year um, that you may only be able to get through the dealer or something like that. But just, just make sure, you know, when you're making that application, make sure your site's on the label. Um, make sure you rinse that container when you're done. Um, if you do a triple rinse or a pressure rinse, um, you, know, you can recycle it uh, at one of my, my recycling sites uh, or in, in the state of Maryland, it's considered a clean solid waste. You can throw it in a dumpster. Uh, if it hasn't been triple rinsed or if it hasn't been pressure rinsed and it goes in the dumpster, um, you're, you're, you're liable. Um, 
And um, this is how we, we scare some of our big applicators to, to participate in our recycling program. Um, in Mississippi, a uh, large applicator, custom applicator, was, was taking stuff to the dump for years and years and years and years. They found an atrazine lake that leaked. They traced it back to him. He had to, he paid to dig all that material out, reline everything, put all the material back. So he basically went out of business. Um, it can happen. So, um, you know, we do have a recycling program. Um, I'll talk about that real quick in a little minute. So, smartphones, a lot of people have them. Um, you know, when you're making that application, um, you know, you've got access to the label uh, pretty much immediately. If, if you're in a bad spot, I live in Kent County, most of the county is a dead spot. Um, you can put a download a PDF to your uh, to your phone and, and that way you have the label handy um, if, if, if one of our guys ever stops. Have any of you been inspected? So, happens once in a while. So. <laughs> um, make sure you're checking your weather conditions before you go out there. Um, there's a lot of devices you can use, um, you know, it, 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 and it's, it's at the location. It's not at the farmhouse, it's, it's at the location, so um, is what we need. Um, we had a custom applicator um, out in Frederick County doing an application down in Montgomery County. He gave us weather conditions for the shop in Frederick County. So um, again, the licensed businesses, we're, we're doing a lot with unlicensed businesses. Um, we had four official complaints on unlicensed businesses, but we issued, um, I think, about 30 warnings last year. Um, just based off a of website, advertisements, Craigslist, Facebook. Um, spot and lantern fly, yeah, it's not going anywhere. Um, you know, my sister lives in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania, near Allentown. I went to visit her back in October. Um, and let me tell you, these things are everywhere. There are, I counted about 30 in the corner of her porch. And then you go out in the yard and they're in every tree, in the crook of the tree, at the base of the tree. They're everywhere. So it's just going to be a matter of time till they're everywhere down here. Um, you know, they're in Cecil County and, and they're probably in other counties too. Um, it, it's just a matter of time. Here's my recycling program. So we did 50 tons of plastic in 18, 2018. Um, we, we are not convenient to everybody. We know that. Um, you know, but we do have sites. On the shore here, we have sites in Chestertown, uh, Easton, and Salisbury. On the western side, we've got one in Hartford County and Street, then Hagerstown and Frederick, and we actually have one in Gaithersburg. Um, you know, if, if there's a neighbors, a bunch of you guys are neighbors, you want to get together and save up your containers for a year, give me a call, and I'll have our contractor come in, and he'll, he'll chip them up and haul them away. Um, but again, we did 50 tons last year. Uh, we did an additional 80 tons, and that, that's 50 tons of what they call high-density polyethylene. Uh, we did another 80 tons. Uh, another company had uh, polystyrene um, that contained an antimicrobial, which is a pesticide. Um, so my contractor, uh, we work with USAG out of Texas. He said, yep, we'll take it. And they came up and they took it. So 80, 80 tons of polystyrene, or 80,000 pounds of polystyrene on top of the, the 50 tons that we collected last year. So that's it. I'm sorry, I went over. Um, you have any questions? I, I, I don't know. I haven't heard. Yep. I've always wondered why, since leather is such a natural absorbent, why it isn't specified on the chemical labels to use rubber boots? That's a good question, and it's a question that um, a lot of the extension folks, folks have brought up to EPA. Um, but um, I don't have an answer. No, no one has, has come up with an answer. Um, you know, I think a lot of, it does provide you with a small amount of protection. Um, the problem is, you know, where do you wear those shoes after you're out of the field? You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I used to be an applicator for many years and I went from, from tractor to, to house every day, you know. 
I think was that they had the leather boots on and they were working with Gramoxa and getting on his shoes and then chronically within 24 hours almost killed him. So, yeah, but I mean, it's EPA is aware of it. Well, again, Washington State has done a lot of work on PPE. Uh, University of Maryland, uh, Eastern Shore has done a lot of work too. And, and they're pressing EPA on that exact issue, but I, I haven't heard anything yet, so. Well, thank you. You all have safe travels home.